All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, thank you for having me here. It's got nice to see all of you here. Uh, so the future of ad tech, um, at least as far as I can see. Um, so let's get right into it. So Kinesso is where I work. It's uh, truly just the data and technology arm of something called the Interpublic Group, which is one of the big five or six, depending on how you count them, advertising companies in the world. Um, it's one of the American ones. Um, so as you see here, it's quite big, 50,000 employees. You see some of the clients, it's brands everybody's heard of. And data and technology in the advertising space means mostly the things I've listed here on the right, which we'll get into more. Uh, but identity is who are the people who are looking at this or that web page who I might want to show an ad or otherwise get something in front of their eyes. Um, audience is something like, which of those people should I try to target? Uh, media buy optimization is what it sounds like. It's more and more an issue though, because there are so many different ways to possibly get in front of someone's eyes that how you allocate those resources is a big deal. And then journey analytics and customization is kind of the more recent stuff where we're trying to work out how does this process work and how can I kind of customize within all of the infrastructure that keeps changing, how I do it to kind of the most optimal way. Um, so then more, more specifically, what I do in my team, the R&D team, as Abhishek said, um, research and development. So there's IPG, then IPG has things like Mad Men, where they really are just looking up at that. So increasingly, because advertising has migrated to digital addressable spaces, and by addressable we mean that we can sort of tell something about you when you're there before we show you something. Um, data and tech is a bigger part of that than ever. And then within that world, there's plenty of people and functions, but my job in particular with the R&D team is to invent new technologies. Uh, we pretty much patent things. If we, if we spend some time looking into something, the plan is to make a new technology that people don't do now, that people will do in the future, or they won't because we've patented it. <laughs> but as you see here, we, we tend to work on something for a year or two. That's pretty much the horizon, which is a luxury that not everybody has. Uh, but the reason we're allowed to do that is because we believe that the things that we put out at the end of that will change the way the market works for five to 10 years. And so as you see here, I've just got a few buzzwords, but some of the things that we spend more time on than other people and other businesses is unsupervised learning, causal networks, uh, deep reinforcement learning, which is something people tried to do 15 years ago and got frustrated and are slowly coming back to. Um, stochastic systems, uh, we bring a lot. I, I worked in finance at one point and we bring a lot from that area. And then non-ergodic optimization, which I think is an okay term that for something I keep saying, which is a sort of ergodic assumption, which is that like, you will eventually get to all of the spaces within your possibilities. It just breaks down in complex problems. And increasingly, I think that's where not just, you know, advertising, but the, the things that people are working on now that in your careers will become cutting edge are ways to address problems where you're not focusing on, in the long run, it works like this, you're focusing on right now, it will work like this, this one time, it's what I am exploiting. Uh, that's kind of the big picture. So then zooming in a little bit, and I'll get in, really, I'm going to spend most of this time just telling you about a handful of projects we're doing. But um, this is kind of three big trends that are going on, at least in my world. So one is we're increasingly focused on individual users, which I suppose is consistent with that more specific kind of looking at things. Uh, it's not just on average what people do. It's can I deal with one person one at a time in a customized way. 
And that is motivated a lot by privacy rules that are shutting down a lot of the ways that you can kind of um, aggregate things because now you need to ask people's permission, which makes that difficult. Uh, which I like because I, I like having to really look closely at things as opposed to treating everyone the same. Then channel list just refers to the idea that um, there's so many different ways to reach people. So television and print, of course, from the old days, but now the internet has produced lots of different things that work differently that you have to spend money differently on. So social media and web pages that have ads and video on the internet. And people increasingly are trying to understand how to treat them all in a way where you can be agnostic to the borders between these things. Because historically, they just don't know how to compare them to each other and kind of coordinate how they're behaving across these spaces. And then less tracking, more interpreting. This again, I think it's, it's happening in the industry because of privacy concerns, which I am all for. Um, it also conveniently tracks pretty closely what I'm talking about with how I like to look at things. Uh, I don't need to like put a label on the back of your head to then follow you around. If I can just interpret data that is less intrusive in ways that allow me to conclude things about that, about the world from it. Uh, and that's, it's hard. You have to be smart and you have to be thoughtful, but the rewards are really starting to pay off. So then real quickly, before I get into a handful of our projects, this is kind of um, the big areas that people are currently working on and what they are currently doing. And, and um, if anybody doesn't know what some of these things are, please speak up because there's lots of terminology in this industry like any, but so, is they would really just, they wanted to know who lived at what address so that they could, and then they could track, did you buy something from this company or that company? And really they would just do this by buying long lists of stuff from companies. And then they would file it and there would be some errors, but more or less you knew that when you bought something about someone with a particular name, you got their phone number and you could tell it was the same person and you then knew they bought something from that store from, and that's how these guys got the address, it's that kind of thing. Uh, we're improving on that both philosophically and technically, which I guess goes for all these boxes. Then audience indication, again, this is where I was saying in the old days, you just would label someone with a cookie and then you could track them nice and easy. It's sort of a technical fix, but not a logical one. It's not you know, elegant in any way. Then activation, that's really just the idea of once I know who I'm trying to show things to, how do I do so efficiently? So in the old days, budget optimization was really, um, they didn't know how to compare one type of showing something to someone to another type. So something on the internet versus something on television, they didn't really understand the way things flow together. And then I have just a blank space under creatives and creative for us, this is another word that we use. Um, that really just means like the picture that gets shown in an advertisement or the video, that's the, the content in a way. And so no one ever did anything technologically with that. There was some stuff in search where, depending on what word a, type, a person typed in, they might get a slightly different image pop up, but very little of that. So then a lot of the things that are going now, at least with us, um, identity resolution is really a probabilistic thing where the nice thing about, I don't know, nice, but the productive thing about this work in the digital space is that it produces data every time anything happens. So every time one of us sees an ad on a web page or in an app or in a video on YouTube, it pr produces a receipt really that gets sent from the platform. And I'll tell you sort of who that is, but it's usually Google, short answer. <laughs> the platform that showed it has to tell the brand, so Coca-Cola or Spotify or whoever, you paid two cents and it went to this place, I don't know who they are, but I know some things about where it went, at what time, on what day, on what web page, and that kind of thing. And so that data is really moving beyond the old stuff where I have to know who a person is, because 
I can just sort of aggregate these things and I don't really ever care what their address is or their phone number is because this is behavior and I don't need to really know anything intrusive about them. Uh, I can just sort of work out how people move around the world. Then audience syndication, again, we can do essentially what I just described, but by grouping people into cohorts based on behavior or interests that we can infer from that behavior. Again, we can do it in pretty not creepy ways. Um, I think I think the creepiness factor of the way a lot of these things have tracked us over the years is a big deal. Uh, certainly since I started working in this space, I spent a lot more time clearing cookies and resetting my maids and turning off all of the can this app access that app data in my phone because it's creepy. <laughs> and and luckily what we do is essentially come up with with intelligent ways to not have to be creepy to get a lot of the same work done. Um, and then creatives. So in the same way that a lot of our budget optimization stuff is about uh, intelligently deciding how much to pay for an ad that will be in front of a given person on a given browser at a given time, that kind of thing. We, we are working on, we have a patent for and haven't put much work into developing it just out of uh, not having resources, but we will get to soon a tool to generate images and we'll see sort of how much of the image we can in fact customize in real time in that this little auction happens in eight milliseconds, I believe, but um, sort of customizing the image to the, really the person who's about to see it in that moment. Uh, so that's, that's just kind of an overview of the handful of stuff that I and people like me tend to work on. Then this is, um, this is really a picture of some of the messy and long supply chain that stands between brands get something in front of. And so every one of these groups, and I'll tell you what some of these initials mean here in a second, but every one of these chunks, uh, both deliberately and accidentally, obscure a lot of data so that there's a, there's a little less, everything as you move to the left, everybody knows a little less about the person who's actually gonna see the little image or video. Because, so a browser, of course, Safari and Chrome, I've started restricting things, but they also, Chrome, the big ad server in the middle is Google. One of the, the biggest DSP, which is a, something called a demand side platform. It's, it's the place where an auction happens, where every brand gets to bid on uh, your eyeballs in an eight millisecond auction that happens. The biggest one of those is also Google. Um, they're starting to face antitrust suits quite rightly. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. But, it, but also the browser, the OS, the devices are all Apple. There's a lot of um, vertical integration in this area so that it's, it's in everybody's interest on this image to um, turn themselves into a portal where everybody else has to come to them. And so everybody's constantly trying to steal business from the person to their left and the person to their right, uh, including us. Um, and I think that the ad agencies in general, because they kind of woke up in the tech business one day without being tech people themselves, they spent a long time just getting beat at it. And so they are a little bit behind. And my job is to help think a little bit outside the box, to use a cliche, to do some catch up in that area. Uh, but so real quickly, what we're looking at here, imagine somebody on the left, BMW or Coca-Cola or some brand you've heard of, and then person on the right is you or I as we sit at home or in a car or somewhere looking at an app or a web page and, and the brands are trying to show someone something because they want them to want to buy something or something like that. So this IPG is essentially the company where I work. We have brands as clients that pay us in weird ways to try to get things in front of people. That's a, that market is a bit dated. Then we tend to log into something called a DSP that I mentioned that their job is to run what's called a programmatic auction. So that on behalf of brands, people who work at companies like mine, but in a different part, they go in and at some cadence daily or weekly or more than daily, 
they keep t turning these little dials that say how much their client will pay for uh, an ad that will get in front of someone with some traits. And so the things you can know and you can use as factors in how much you do or don't want to see them are things like what OS are they on? What browser are they on? Uh, what zip code are they in? And, or metro or region, which in the US means state usually. Um, you can also th things about like what time of day you may be targeting a certain time of day. Uh, there's a handful of factors that at the moment you are about to see that ad, this data gets sort of sent up the stream. The DSP gets it. They then kind of have an algorithm that looks through what everybody put in as their settings already. That's why they call it programmatic because you've just programmed what your preferences are. Then they pick the winner just based on who said they like this particular set of data points the best. That then the DSP um, sends off information to the ad server, which is another Google entity, to say, Coca-Cola won this auction, send the Coca-Cola ad that we stored in location number 1,074 to the person at this IP address. And then they do, and then you get the picture on your screen, and that happens really, really fast. Uh, and then SSP is just another middleman um, that is very often part of the ad server. It's, it's sort of a corrupt way to take more money off the table. Um, and there's, there's actually even more types of things that can be in here, but they tend to just be little ways to game the system. Uh, but that's roughly how, when you're scrolling down, you know, newyorktimes.com and that box is about to put, come up on your screen, uh, that whole process gets triggered. And by the time it scrolls up on your screen, the ad is there. And that's really the market that we are in. It's, it's something like a financial market, except there's no secondary market. So I can't, and the way that I, if I think that Apple stock is underpriced for some reason, I can't, I, I can buy, buy Apple stock and find someone who actually understands that it was overpriced and that if I sell to them, I make some money. In this world, because the asset is essentially instantaneous, it's not preserved for any amount of time, I can't really do that, which makes it a much more difficult space to work in, but it's got a lot of opportunity. So then starting to get into some of the real problems we work on. Um, this, I mean for this to look messy, both mainly because it is a messy problem. And it's something that no one really knows how to fix, though I think we have a good solution that we're creating. Uh, and it's the thing we're mostly working on with Professor Brown and we saw Fedor and Pranatha in here. They've been working with it, with us on it in um, their capacity as Kinesco Research Fellow. So. Uh, but so this sort of represents the idea that, let's say Coca-Cola knows I have a, they have a million dollars and they're going to spend it over the next six months. Actually, Coca-Cola is a bad example. Um, BMW, let's say. And now they've got a million dollars to spend on advertising. They need to turn it into as much making money as a company selling widgets that, as they can. And so where do they spend it? Because there's a whole bunch of different ways and places and it's kind of, there are too many different ways, right? And, and this is where I get into the, we need to be able to treat it as a non ergodic space because if you tried to search every option, you'd just spend a billion years and you might actually find out the best way by then, but the world would be over. And even if it weren't over, it would be different and you'd have to start searching again. And so this, this, this row here is just the different channels. So television or out of home is what this stands for. That's things like bus stops and billboards because that's actually a real part of the system. And then digital is really the space that I work in. And what I'm mostly doing is trying to make everything else work like digital, at least in ways that we can compare them. And then search is, it's a digital thing, but it's a slightly work slightly differently. So then within each of these, the real, the real useful idea is something that in this business, they, they usually call the sales journey or the, the sales funnel. And it's, this is where a lot of our causal modeling comes in because people tend not to want to think about what's really going on. They want to sort of give me some data and I'll run the handful of models on it that everybody runs and I'll spit out some numbers and then that's your problem. But I think increasingly, and this is probably something you guys should think about because this is the world you're moving into. 
that's not really going to help anybody. Everybody will know how to run a boosted tree and an XG and a, all these things. And so really what you need to understand, you need to understand those models so that you can then look at the world in which you're working, problem space, and try to work out how to best apply those tools. You know, you don't, every carpenter needs to know how his various hammers and saws work. But if he spends all his time thinking about how to make hammers, he'll be out of luck because there's a factory that can make hammers, right? He has to understand how to look at the world and know which hammer to use and then how to use it. Um, so as you see here, this prospecting, targeting, action conversion, this is really just the different steps in the process of prospecting means getting someone to know what your brand is, right? Has, any, have, has the person actually seen the word BMW before? Then targeting is figuring out which of those people actually might be interested in buying a car. Then an action is, can I get them to go to my website and build up their own BMW or something? And then conversion is when they actually buy a car and I make money. Um, but a lot of how you allocate money around to the different ways has to do with efficiently aligning this. Because if you spend a lot of money here, and it produces a lot of people who are ready to be, you know, moved into the next bucket, but then you don't have any money left over to do anything there. You've, you've screwed up. And so you need to understand this sequence um, in order to really allocate properly. Then again, there's just another like segmentation, which is there's different groups of people in the world who probably behave differently and they need to figure out, number one, how does this work for each of them? And number two, how should I allocate my spending to each of them. Then sort of a similar question about platforms, and this is just people who kind of own that DSP process for different parts of the internet. Um, and really this, you, could, you can rearrange the order of these rows and it wouldn't make a difference because the whole point is that you just have over which things can be segmented. And what happens is people don't know how to deal with that because what they're used to doing is saying, I have a million dollars, let me make a decision on how to allocate it to among the first row. And so they come up with some number of ways. And then once you've got, you know, 25 here, 30 here, 40 here, 15 here, five here, uh, then they start to divide what this is among the next row. But what happens is your decision down here affects what the decision up here should have been. So you get this feedback loop. Um, and so again, we sort of need a, a more algorithmic and less equation-based way to, to approach this, uh, which is in line with the non-ergodic idea I was talking about before. Um, and then similarly, what we are seeing is that the industry kind of looks at a lot of these different problems in different ways, and it's really all just different angles on the same problem. There's really only one thing going on, and it's buying access to people's eyeballs and how do I pick the right ones, right? And what things should I show them? Because um, that first couple of slides I showed you is a bunch of words that I've resisted over time because they're really just like organizational silos that have evolved over the years in the industry. And they probably shouldn't exist as separate things and it kind of drives me crazy. Um, and so as you see here, out of that, out of this bunch of nodes, which is essentially a time dependent causal network if anyone's interested you can kind of pick and choose and produce the different problems but if you do that you're losing information you're losing uh conclusions you that would affect the outcome here by some of the lines that were over here before that are no longer in your system and there's sort of an old proverb i think it comes from northern india and it's about the blind men and the elephant and it's where the proverb goes there's sort of five or six blind men and you take them up to an elephant and if they've never seen an elephant before, the one feeling its nose says, oh, it's like a snake. And the one feeling its ears say, oh, an elephant is like a fan. And if, so if you're sort of over-focused on one area, you don't realize that it's this large, organic, and quite complex system. And I think this industry, probably most industries end up with this problem. Um, but it's something that is, my team gets called in to look at different areas. I think we sort of have a nice 
insight on. And we tend to build things that address, I hope, address the market as that large interconnected complex beast. Uh, and we're currently trying to build a simulation of it, which is why I'm talking about gamification here, because we think we can source insights from having people try to play even a imperfect simulation of this large system. Um, actually, I'm going to stop there. Before I get into some of the things we're building, is there any questions or anything I can clarify? Or did anybody find any of that at all um, possible to follow, first of all? Okay, well, I'm just gonna move on then. I didn't hear anybody, if anybody spoke up. Um, how are we on time? Are we supposed to be done at five, at 6.30? Right, yeah. Okay. Yep. So I'll, I'll jump quickly through some of the tools. So the big thing that we're working on with some of your fellow students and with Professor Brown, something we call the ORCO project, but it is an optimizer that uses a combination of a causal model and reinforcement learning, but across a couple of different levels. So this is a kind of high level idea. In complex systems, if, if any of you have done any work in this area, you'll recognize some of this. But if you haven't, I, I encourage you to look into some of the some of the academic work is being done around complex systems and just complexity generally. Uh, a lot of the work that started out as ways to figure out why galaxies formed where they did and not in all these other possible places. And similarly, why did some of the species that have existed on Earth come to exist and not others that seem just as likely? Uh, it's actually quite relevant both to my work here, but all kinds of spaces. Um, I think it's increasingly going to be a big, a big source of uh, reference for lots of areas. But so one of the things is that in complex spaces, you need um, you need insights. Uh, you need, because you're, you're talking about kind of looking for a needle in a haystack. And so if you're just going to search the whole universe for which answer is right, you will be searching forever. It's just, a, it's just a fact. So you need some understanding of what it is, what is the phenomenon you're trying to understand, you know, so that I cannot look in ways, in places that just, there won't be anything there. Um, and that requires a bit of taking a step back and looking at the phenomenon or asking people who've worked on it forever. And so you, you need to be able to kind of synthesize some information that will turn out to be terrible, some information that will be useful. But a lot of, this is where a lot of our human, human machine interaction comes in, where we need to figure out how to extract the things people do know in ways that can feed an optimization problem and set us up with, a, usually as a sort of Bayesian prior, um, so that we're not starting from scratch where we're just guessing at how the universe might work. Um, so that's the idea of reducing the search space. Um, and then this is an abstracted version of that consumer journey I was talking about. And then these yellow arrows are really the, how much does what happens getting uh, some ads in front of people affect um, their likelihood to click on something later or to buy something. And so every one of these yellow arrows really represents an edge in a um, time-dependent causal network. Uh, this is a kind of graphical version of that. But the way we're approaching this is to have a UX that works out essentially the what this is representing. How do we set up this network so that then the reinforcement learning and the multi-armed bandits that go to work are really just parameter tuning. Uh, so the structure is there and now we're just just sort of zeroing in on values for very particular parameters and then the whole system kind of works uh, or at least works better than the way things work now. And so this is the structure that we have a multi-armed band uh, for every one of those functions that shows up in the consumer journey. And that's for reasons that have to do with what a multi-armed bandit really is, what it is and what it's good at. So a multi-armed bandit can tell you how to allocate a resource among competing options, but they have to be pursuing the same goal and they have to take in the same resource. 
And so that's where the metaphor comes from. It's a whole bunch of slot machines and I have a dollar, which one should I put it in? So they're all trying to do the same thing. They're all taking in the same resource to do it. I just wanna know which one's most likely to be best at it. And so similarly, that's why we have to use a causal network because we have to figure out which places we could spend our money are in fact trying to achieve the same thing. And that's why we have to kind of work out this causal network that tells us these things over here are trying to get people's attention. These things over here are trying to turn people's attention into people's you know, interest or some more serious thing and, and on and on like that. And so then to make that thing work most efficiently, we have to understand how much attention plus how much money produces how much interest. And then that's what those the edges of that um, causal network represent. And then at the top here, this is the more familiar reinforcement learning agent, like the kind of thing that plays chess, where it works out um, at any moment, you know, the things that have already happened, what next handful of things would have to happen for something good, and what is my best option to sort of maximize my expected value further down that causal uh, chain. Though one way in which our world is very different from playing chess is that we can't just play a billion games of chess online. Playing a game for us costs money. And it's very difficult to simulate because the world is so complex that you can't just program a computer to play you, right? You can't, the thing across the table from us is six billion humans with changing tastes that come from all the millions of things they do every day. And so we have to be quite clever about how we look for signal or just decide there's none there, uh, look at historical data, um, simulate things, but be very careful about not deluding ourselves about what we can and can't simulate, um, that kind of thing. And then this is just kind of a breakdown of the reinforcement learning that we do. Um, you probably know all of this. Our value function incorporates something we patented that models user something called a Markov modulated Poisson process. Uh, so you may know a Markov chain just sort of models. If you have a bunch of states, it, it produces a. If I have a bunch of states and I can produce a probability of uh, the transition from any one state to any other state, then I can do a lot of things about where a person, which state a person might be in and how much time they might spend and how they'll move between those states. And so for us, those states are looking at one thing or another in the world. Uh, so I'm looking at newyorktimes.com, I'm on Facebook, I'm sleeping, I'm not looking at anything. Those are the states. And then in each state, there will be an arrival process that you can model that is for us, um, when will this person see an ad or when will they be on a website that we find interesting? And so we use that to do a lot of prediction of, um, it, it helps us understand what will be, what will the value of having a person see this and this and this because we can work out where we think they might be next and what we can do then. Um, and then this is the last thing. This is that what I mentioned a second ago. Um, there's no reinforcement learning without action. And because for us simulating things is impossible or expensive, we sort of have to work out ways to do a little small version of it in the world that we can convince someone to let us spend their money doing and then build their confidence to expand it and then expand it and that kind of thing. And this is a very frustrating but unavoidable part of doing any kind of cutting edge technology uh, that you should all keep in mind because it's, it never goes away. So then this is, um, we've only got five minutes before we should open to questions. This is the, just the other big tool. I got much less on this, but this is really kind of record linkage problem that we've been working on. It, it uses a lot of um, Bayes theorem in kind of high dimensions and in very specific ways. So those records I mentioned earlier about every time you see an ad, someone gets a receipt. Um, there's a bunch of different places that those records go and they, they contain different data. 
But it turns out to be useful to be able to work out which of those were the same one and which went to the same people because then you can start to work out people's patterns without knowing anything about them in particular. It's just an ad went here and an ad went there. I don't know their name or their address and, and it's nice to keep it that way. And so um, what you see here is we, we sort of did two versions that since I made this slide, we've combined. So one of them uses Bayesian probabilities to produce a probability of a match. Um, and this is where it's just, what is the likelihood that all of these fields would have matched or not matched in this pattern if it wasn't the same event, right? And it just gets a little complicated when you're doing that with things that are interrelated and correlated. And then on the right, it's a more robust version of that, but it's, um, it is less precise, but more robust to problems in the pattern where it just sort of counts up information scores. But the, the thing you get at the end is just a number. It's not obviously interpretable. It's just that a bigger number is better than a smaller number. And so when you then have to act on that, it gets a little unclear what you need to do. But what we do is we use um, a sort of off the shelf optimization algorithm you may have heard of called the Blooming Graph Optimization Algorithm that once we've assigned scores to every possible combination using things on the first slide, um, this thing works out, it sort of sorts out the best um, possible set of matches that is both possible in the world because if you match something with one thing, it can't match anything else, uh, and then maximizes the expected probability of match over all those. Um, so this stuff is very, mathematical in much less data science ways. There's no model here. It's just looking at the phenomenon, working out the very in-depth, precise mathematical way to do it, and then running that algorithm. There's no, there's no machine learning here. It's just humans looking at the problem, figuring out what math tells me the answer, and just getting it refined until it works. Uh, and so that's a pretty good, good break. Slides are just um, some bias stuff we're working on. And that first slide I showed with the long supply chain, every one of those is just a, a place for bias to enter the system. And so we're working with, uh, in particular, some students at UC Berkeley about ways to intervene. Um, currently, we're focused on something kind of in this area where we're taking a bit of an agnostic view. And in the process where people are trying to pick out the audiences they want to reach, we're really just highlighting the statistical effects that a selection, so for example, if I say I want to target males for something, which is probably an okay idea, you know, some products maybe are just for males, um, less so all the time, but things like that are still sort of true. Um, so instead of just saying, no, you should never do that, which I don't think we would get away with, we at least show in ways people can understand how that is affecting other, uh, the distribution of other values. So did that do something to the ethnicity you know, arrangement of the audience I now have left or to the income bracket? So that then correlations that have been built into the data, either through bad data or through terrible things from society, um, we aren't like emphasizing those in this feedback loop. We at least are noticing that so that we can think about it and come up with ways to either not do that or to sort of ameliorate it in other ways. Um, but this is a problem that I've been pushing to get some real effort on and we're finally getting it and we're building some tools to hopefully um, stamp it out. Uh, but with that, I'll open up to questions. <laughs>